you could get swept in the social media world and everyone's telling you it's a great marketing tool and it's great for if you want to have a cause, you need to get on it, you need to let people know your personality, blah, blah, blah. And I tell guys, first, make sure you know what you're doing. Don't ever think that you can't text your friends and have a conversation. Don't think that makes you not real because you're not voicing all your opinions. You know, we're all in here. We all have opinions on everything. We don't tell our bosses or we don't, you know, tell a coworker everything we feel. We have friends and family uh, that we do that with too. So I think you have to, you know, first sit down and understand how you want to use your social media um, and then determine, you know, what you want to say or say and not say on it. While professional athletes have worked hard, they've reached the peak of their profession. Um, and in many cases, though not all, have tapped the capital markets, some would demand that quote unquote athletes should shut up and dribble. Think about that for a minute. Would any American, would any other professional who has reached the peak of their career be asked to do the same? Tonight's diverse panel features athletes who not only give their time, raise awareness, create social change, but individuals who lean on athletes to better our community. So with that, I'll say that we're gonna welcome Shara Springer, who's gonna lead our discussion. Shara covers stories at the intersection of sports and society for WBUR. And I think where I'd like to start is when athletes have a, a platform like they do now, how do they choose? How do they begin to sort through the opportunities that are out there for them to have a voice? So I'll turn to you, Devin, and what is that process like? How do you begin to figure out what causes you're going to support, whether they're charitable causes or um, social justice causes? Well, I think it starts with what you're passionate about. You know, I think um, for myself and, you know, obviously I have a twin brother that's in the NFL as well. So uh, my mom was always big on us to do everything together. So um, my second year in the NFL and I felt like I, I could have a career, I wanted to do something, you know, other than just play football. And that's when we came up with sickle cell and, and, you know, trying to raise awareness and money. But it was because my aunt and uncle have the disease. You know, my, aunt, my grandfather passed away from the disease. So it was in my family. Um, and I think that is what started to drive. You know, I wasn't just going to things because I decided to sign myself up. I was passionate. I was into it. I wanted to raise awareness and money, you know, just as much as the next person. And I think that's where, as an athlete, you have to start um, so that you're not just putting your name on something or showing up for the time slot, but that you're actually invested in it. And when it comes to social justice causes, how do you begin to choose those? Um, I think the same way, you know, and I think the thing that I learned fast was we had to lean on a lot of experts that do this work every day. Um, so we took our, you know, hardcore grassroots passions and how we felt uh, about certain subjects and we kind of shut up and listened and understood uh, what these people saw every day when they were in the communities and they were working with individuals or they were fighting legislation. We got to learn firsthand uh, what they did and then we used our platform, you know, we used our voice um, and we didn't use our voice just to push our own message, but to push the message of the people that we felt knew what, we're going, what was going on the most. And we just tried to scream it out to the world. Mm -hmm. Now, April, I want to turn to you because when we talked, you said you were trying to figure out how to use your platform. You're not someone who grew up with a lot of social activism in women's soccer. So where does that stand for you as, you know, you've been a player, a coach, a technical director, how are you figuring out how to use your voice at this stage? Yeah, start with the hardest question there. Why don't you? <laughs> I know you can take it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think when we were speaking about these uh, questions, uh, one of the things I had said is that I was certainly as strong-minded, strong opinions. I knew what was good, right, wrong, all of those things as an athlete. Uh, but I never found my voice as an athlete. We didn't have social platforms. I am um, at 55 on some social platforms, the ones that are facilitating what I need, and I am not on most of the other ones. So um, I'm not trying to get likes or follows. I, I, just, I came from the generation before networking, and um, you fall behind, actually, when you're not like that. So you try to keep up. But I'm, I think I'm finding, I'm in the process, it's still going of finding my voice because I really worked for our federation for, and between being a player and a coach, I was, 
an employee of the Federation for, or part of the Federation for nearly 30 years. And I didn't feel right to criticize. So um, I'm learning. And what's interesting is the 30 year olds are teaching me because they're more brave than I am now or was then, or I'm learning that um, it's okay to stand up and speak your mind. And certainly on an individual basis and a private basis, I would. But I've always, I've been a pu public figure really. I'm not like you, Devin. But <laughs> since I was 20, I became aware at 20 that I was maybe a role model for some people. So I always took that responsibility very seriously and muted myself in a way. Hmm. So I was gonna say, you mentioned you're learning from the 30 year olds yeah. on the US Women's National Team. I think we got an, all got a good glimpse um, of what they bring to their platforms during the World Cup. Is there a particular role model on the team or is, is there something that they are doing where you say, you know what, I wanna try that. I wanna sort of be brave like these women and try that with my own voice. You know, you hear of the names like Megan Rapino and Carly Lloyd, but behind the scenes, there's two other people doing a lot of work in the Players Association, and uh, three others, and they're finding their voice in the Players Union. And there, I played way before there was ever even a thought about having a Players Union for women's soccer. So for their advocacy efforts, I'm proud of them. I coached them. And so to see Sam Mewis, for example, um, actually who's from Boston, that was actually kind of random. I wasn't doing that to play, play to the crowd, but Sam Mewis is from here. She's on the executive committee for the Players Association. She's finding her voice. Um, so she's a little bit of a role model. And Becky Sauerbrunn and Kelly O'Hara also serve on it as does Alex Morgan. And then there's the omnipresent, omnipotent Megan Rapino. And <laughs> that's not really my style. But um, I have had a million and one conversations with people about either how Alex Morgan held her teacup, right? Can you believe it, Devin? She scored a goal in the World Cup, held a teacup because we were playing the English, and she drank it, and she was criticized for that. And we're like, double standards, the NFL, what they do, the NBA, what they do. So I did try to... When those conversations were happening, I found myself defending our behaviors, um, even though I may not be that or do that. And um, I felt that it was a chance to educate more than defend, actually. Now, Rebecca, you've been both a professional women's soccer player and now you are head of the Red Sox Foundation. And I'm curious, having you know, had those dual roles or had you know, the athlete role and now the head of the foundation role, how that influences the way in which you make decisions and you use resources um, for the Red Sox Foundation, including player resources. Um, so it's so funny always speaking on a panel with a male professional athlete because the, you, we'll, we'll, we'll see how many questions you get at the end of this event and how many I get as the pro athlete on this panel. There's a double standard and, and discrepancy. Um, so, I, you know, in my role today, I feel very blessed to be at the head of the Red Sox Foundation. Um, and as you heard, I used to be at the Boston Celtics. As a professional former athlete, um, I think it only enables me to be more aware of how to leverage the assets that the team has as a professional team. So having been on the side of a player, I can kind of understand what it's like when you ask a player after a game or a practice to go do something. I understand what it's like, as Devin said, to really ask the questions um, and ask a player to go to something that might be in their wheelhouse in terms of their passion and their interests. So I, I just think I have a unique perspective in that way, which has only aided me, I think, in my role at the Red Sox Foundation. Um, I will say though, having also been an athlete, that I mostly, this is for the young people in the room, I tend to look to hire athletes, um, having been one myself, because I feel like there are so many transferable skills that I used on the field as a leader, as a former captain, um, and as an elite athlete that transitioned very, very successfully into the workplace. And so things like communication, teamwork, um, ability to uh, you know, just work towards a, a, a collective goal. Um, all of that really enables my team, most of whom happen to be athletes, to be a successful team. Um, and so I forget what you even initially asked me, but I'm just gonna keep talking um, and <laughs> say that in my platform now, because I know this is something you wanted me to talk about, in my platform now I just feel very 
privileged to use what I've seen as a former athlete and as a black female um, and really try to move forward um, the issues and the causes um, and the priorities of populations that don't have such platforms. Um, and so making sure that I can be intentional in hire w hiring women, being intentional in hiring people of color, being intentional about putting resources behind issues that no one can argue with social justice. It's not a black or white thing. It's not a male or woman, if male or female thing. It is a humanity thing. And I think making sure that you can have someone at the helm of roles like mine that have at the forefront of their priorities um, situations and causes like that can only move us forward as a human race. And so those are some of the things that I just very intentionally think about in my role, again, as a black female, uh, former professional athlete. Um, and, and again, I, no, no one really argues with that. I'm not being militant in my actions. I'm being, um, I think, humane. Mm -hmm. Now, Michael, you're you fill an interesting part of this equation, which is- The non-athlete. The yeah. non-athlete. I, I was, I was gonna- Played in high school. Okay, okay, what'd, what'd you play? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> um, so, y you have to figure out which athletes you wanna work with. That's your choice. So, how do you, one, figure out which athletes are a good match for Children's Hospital, and also then, how you're gonna leverage those athletes' platforms? Uh, great question. And, you know, we have a lot of athletes that um, do a lot of wonderful things in the community. And there are a lot of amazing organizations and charities that really benefit from um, the exposures that athletes provide. Um, you know, when athletes approach us, you can tell very early on what they're in it for. Um, and for the most part, the athletes are in it there to, uh, to bring the joy and the awareness um, to the hospital and to those sick kids that are that are in the hospital, but those athletes that are often leading with um, the press availability and making sure that uh, their their the photographer is is able to go into some of the rooms and leading with those questions, you can tell very early on. You know, the, the one thing is I'm going to take this opportunity, and I've been waiting to do this. You know, I think Devin's being very humble in terms of um, what he's done for sickle cell and what his brother has done for sickle cell. So um, at Boston Children's Hospital, we're in the process of, of working on a drug that uh, will hopefully cure uh, sickle cell. And I should, should say not if, but when. And back at the very beginning, 10 years ago, Devin was there. Jason was there. He raised money for the hospital. He raised awareness. It was one of the first people that really stood up and said, sickle cell is uh, you know, a terrible disease that affects hundreds of thousands of people and really got behind it. So someday um, soon, uh, the, the trials that Children's has been doing around sickle cell, we are in patients now, and those patients have been uh, symptom-free for 15 months. So very hopeful that this is uh, headed in the right direction. But someday, you know, they're going to host, uh, hoist a trophy when we cure sickle cell. And on the names of that trophy are going to be doctors, they're going to be nurses, they're going to be researchers. But Devin and Jason's name are going to be on there as well because they've been an advocate for that since the very beginning. Thank you. I will, I will follow. Uh, I've had the opportunity to actually go to Children's, and uh, I know one of the, uh, the young men who has gone through the trials, he actually got to go to the Super Bowl um, in Atlanta in February, and the hospital was awesome because they moved back all his stuff so he could go to the Super Bowl. Um, so that's been amazing just to witness and uh, to talk to him through his journey of, you know, day to day, what he goes through and how he's feeling. Um, it's been a lot of hard, hard work by a lot of different people. Is that the ultimate, you know, when you're making a decision about what you want to get behind, is that the ultimate when you're, you have a, a disease that has affected your family and you're now looking 10 years after your involvement with this at a cure? Yeah, I think in the beginning, you know, when I jumped in, you know, that's what it was. And, you know, my aunt, uh, she passed away in January, but she was always, she would always tell me she got to do so many great things when she was young because she was fearless. Uh, all the things they told her not to do, she kind of walked the, the line of, you know, taking care of herself, but also traveling when they told her to be careful traveling. And, um, you know, I thought that was like the end all be all that, you know, maybe someday they find a cure and cure my aunt. And then I started to build relationships with young men and young women who I got to meet when they were like 12 years old. And now they're graduating high school and they're in college and still talking to them and chiming in with them on their journey. And to now hear, you know, the trials, um, I realized how much bigger it was than me and my family um, to just get involved and, and people coming up to you and they say thank you. Um, but not realizing like how much purpose I found in it selfishly um, by doing it. And, you know, so... 
uh, it's kind of taken a life of its own that I never really expected. Um, and I've just been very humble to be a part of the journey with a lot of different people. I want to switch a little bit from the medical to the political. Um, it's interesting when you look at the history of athletes and activism, it sort of goes in cycle. You had, you know, very active figures um, in the 1960s, of course, we think of Muhammad Ali. But then if you go, let's say, to the 90s, some of the most prominent athletes like a Michael Jordan or a Tiger Woods sort of didn't want to wade into political waters. But now we're in an uptick. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that evolution and how it has impacted everyone here on the panel. And I actually want to start with April because you had said to me, you, you've been a part of the national team since I believe 1986 as a player, if I'm doing my math right. And um, you had said that you didn't want to rock the boat. And for a very long time, professional female soccer players didn't want to rock the boat. So what has happened and what flipped the switch and... and First of all, let's start with why didn't you want to rock the boat and then what changed? Yeah, I mean, despite my competitiveness, despite my um, exterior and my sort of confidence back in the 80s and all of that, I actually was pretty much a pacifist. And I think what triggers it is, um, and when I say it, it's becoming more of an activist, is you education, it starts with that. And once you know something, you can't unknow it, right? And so um, you think about it, you have a conversation. Remember you said you wanna have a conversation tonight. So we're looking forward to some of the questions, but once you know something, you can't unknow it. And so that, that triggers me, that triggers the people around us. Our particular evolution in women's soccer was that we had some extremely bright players coming through our system and they wanted more salary they wanted more recognition. They were bright. They knew how to get it. And oh, by the way, they bumped into Billie Jean King at the 96 Olympics. Mm. I'll never That'll forget. Do it. <laughs> the 96 Olympics, we were sitting in that Fulton baseball stadium for eight hours, 95 degrees in July in suits. And Billie Jean King turned to me and said, my dogs are barking. I've been in these <laughs> shoes for... You know, I love that expression, my dogs are barking. And so what happened is Julie Foudy and Billie Jean King struck up a friendship. And she passed on a lot of good advice to Julie Foudy. And I know that in a, in a lot of ways you can thread Julie Foudy to the women's ice hockey team. And some of the players on the women's ice hockey team, she sort of espoused some of the same lessons to women's ice hockey. So I think it's education. And I think there's um, people passing the education on and uh, boosting of confidence. When you have, I think you may know better than me because I don't track this stuff, but I think Alex Morgan is the women's soccer player, one of our faces of women's soccer. I think she has more followers than any other soccer player in America, men or women. Right? Sounds, sounds for, check for me. Check. But research? I, check. Can you oh, check? Yeah. Actually, I could not check. I don't. I, actually, I could check Twitter. Um, one way direction. But my point being is when you get, I'm going to go with 1.3, it's a guess, million people loving you, it empowers you a little bit to start saying what you think. Right? 12.9 million followers. Okay, was, I was off a little. <laughs> 12 point, Abby Wambach only has like one point something, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so I was talking to the Suffolk players earlier. So yeah, when you have 12 million followers, it empowers you a little bit to speak mm -hmm. and speak out. And Sorry, 13.6. <laughs> she gained a whole bunch recently. Who? <laughs> Alex has 13.6. Oh, okay. So there was my one. Yeah. So my point, do you, yep. you guys get my point? Like, boy, that's empowering. And that's nice for our women to be saying, I want to hear what you say, yeah. and I like what you're saying. And they just sort of trickle it down, and they trickle it out, I guess, through Twitter, and it's a pretty nice um, method, I think. Mm -hmm. Staying with the athlete side of this, um, Devin, did you have anyone who, like a Billie Jean King in your life, someone who kind of inspired you and sort of showed you the way when it came to social activism? No, not really. I think what you said was very interesting. I talked to Michael Bennett about that. Um, 
because we talked about, you know, as we were growing up, you know, I was born in 1987, so in the 90s watching sports and, you know, a huge fan of basketball, you know, you didn't see any of that. You know, I never I never thought athletes were supposed to, to do that. And, and like you said, April, I thought as an athlete, like I, I took pride in being a role model and, you know, saying the right things and doing the right things. And then I remember watching a special um, on Bill Russell and him talking about his time as a Celtic player and, you know, not wanting to come back to the city because of how poorly he was treated. And um, watching that and being a player in the New England area, I was like, wow, you know, like for a guy to be, in my mind, you know, one of the greatest basketball players to ever play, I, I thought he was just celebrated all the time in the area. And just to see that, you know, the 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 break in the relationship between the city and, and one of the greatest players to ever play when the statue was coming back, uh, kind of opened my eyes. And I, I just felt like at a time, you know, especially playing on the Patriots where the thought process is that everyone's a robot and we just do, you know, what Coach Belichick says, which is the total opposite of how it is in New England. Um, I thought it was a great opportunity to go and speak about things that, you know, not just myself, but a lot of my teammates either went through or their parents went through. Um, and I thought, you know, we have an opportunity now to go do that. And, you know, obviously it came with a lot of positives and uh, a, a lot of negatives, but um, I think we've been able to sort through that. Um, and like you said, Rebecca, it's a humane thing. And I think when we first, you know, whether it was raising a fist or we took a knee or we spoke out, people were, you know, going crazy. It was uproar. You know, these guys need to line up and, and just play football on Sunday. Uh, they need to get cut. They need to be traded. Um, and I think you fast forward to now and people actually see some of the things we care about, you know, equal education, you know, not seeing seven-year-olds prosecuted, you know, for juvenile uh, things from just getting arrested in school for acting out, you know, some things that I'm sure everyone has done, uh, whether it's elementary school or high school, and to go and now be a part of those things and people to see um, some of the positives and some of the things that we actually wanted to do um, has been very humbling. And I think um, it took, you know, taking a step out on the ledge, though, to, to really see that. And, you know, I, I really thank my teammates for supporting me and then jumping on board and, and not having to feel alone um, because I think then once you get alienated, you end up like how the NFL has done Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. Do you want to elaborate on, on oh, that? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> you, you don't get fined for that. Um, <laughs> So you want to keep this a low-cost event. <laughs> yeah, no. You know, I talked to Malcolm Jenkins about that. Malcolm Jenkins plays safety for the, for the Eagles um, and one of the co-founders of the Players Coalition. And I remember maybe it was a year and a half ago, two years ago, talking um, that if it was only four or five of us speaking out on different things, that we wouldn't be speaking for long because the NFL could easily get rid of four or five guys, release us, and then every team decide not to pick us up. It's not colluding, but, you know, you call it what you want. Um, and we talked about growing this thing as players and, and being able to have more than one person speaking out because uh, in Kaepernick's case, I think he became um, the sacrificial lamb for all of us as players um, and for a bunch of different causes he believes in. And, you know, to this day, I have the utmost respect for him because he did things when it wasn't popular. You know, he took a knee in preseason games um, before anybody was talking about this or anyone was doing anything. He spoke out, and whether you agree or disagree with everything he's ever said, um, you have to have a lot of respect for a man that puts his career on the line um, and now will probably never play again, um, even though we watch bum after bum get picked up at quarterback position. Um, but he probably won't because of that, because he decided to speak out, um, and I think, you know, but from 20 years from now, we'll always be talking about what he did and what he meant to, you know, our generation and a generation that comes after us. Now, on the foundation side, um, on the hospital side, let's say, you know, it's interesting because you're now dealing with athletes like Devin um, who want to speak out, who are speaking out, who are out on that ledge, so to speak. Um, how does that affect your decision making um, when it comes to what you do with athletes, which athletes you use? Um, and in some respect, does it worry you? Um, to be associated with outspoken athletes 
And I can either, Mike, Rebecca or Michael can. Uh, I don't think first. I can go forward without doing the math. You were born in 87. That's like, <laughs> how old? That's so young. I can't move forward beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, in all seriousness. So for me, I'm actually, I was surprised when I came to the Red Sox how few players were involved in the community and how few players of ours actually are standing up for um, either a political or a social cause. Not many of them do. Um, and this is in juxtaposition to my role at the Boston Celtics, and a lot of our players were outspoken. So I was there from 2006 to 2010 through the championship with Paul, Kevin, um, Ray, Rajan, Kendrick. Um, and the big three, were they were prominent key players, marquee players in the league, and they would say what they wanted when they wanted. Um, and I think having both, again, been on the former player, now Red Sox side, I've seen the trend be that players that have are more veteran and more kind of um, secure, if you will, in their role within the league and their team and their life are the ones mo most often um, more willing to step forward and be the champion of a cause and be uh, the voice of, of, of reason in, in many cases. And so for, for me at the Boston Celtics, I'm actually trying to pull guys into some causes and into some programming, into some events. They just are unwilling. Now, part of it is we play 1,052 games a year and it's just insane. And they're never here. They're here for like a week and then they're gone for a week. And so the schedule is very, very difficult. But um, they, they just are unwilling to step forward and really take a stand on something I've seen. And that's not calling out anybody in particular, but it's been a struggle, to be honest, to get guys to really stand behind something and willingly say, no, I believe in this, and no, I don't. Um, we do have some players that are better than others. I'm just using that word because I don't, you know what I mean. But like Jackie Bradley Jr. is amazing. He has been there all along the way uh, for our scholars program. He comes to schools when we need him to. He is there and willing. Him and his wife are very down to earth. I don't know you, but you seem to be the same way. Just they're real people that if you bump into them, they're, they're substantive and there's like a there there and they get it and they know the importance of giving back and they recognize their platform and their privilege and want to pay that forward. Um, and so we have a couple players, but again, no one's really, we don't have a cap, I feel like, in, in uh, not on our team at all. And maybe not even in our league. And I think that's something that I want to try to help um, foster in some of our players is the um, need for someone to really champion something and really be a voice because your platform's gone. I hate to say it, but you're, you miss that platform when you step down and you take that uniform off really. Um, and so it's a really important critical time in their careers and one that they should not overlook or miss. Am I from a hospital perspective, I've been with Boston Children's for 10 years, and to my knowledge, we've never turned away an athlete who wants to come in and, and really support the hospital. The, the key is we're treating very, very sick children, and everyone in that building, everyone that comes in that building is focused on making the kids better. So um, regardless of their uh, beliefs outside of uh, making children feel better, um, really the key important factor and ingredient with the athletes coming in is, you know, they're truly there to bring joy to someone's life. These kids, um, are they're getting better because of medicine. They're getting be better because of therapy. They're also getting better because of their emotional state. Um, and the excitement that a child feels when an athlete that they look at as a superstar comes in absolutely helps um, in their recovery. So uh, we're less concerned about um, someone's political affiliation or their uh, beliefs outside of, you know, child health. Sure, we, can I mention something there? Absolutely. Yeah. April. So I was just thinking while Devin and Becca and Michael were giving their points, when Megan Rapino, women's soccer player, first took a knee in support of uh, Colin Kaepernick, um, she was heavily criticized. Um, things like, we have to ban her from doing that, to we have to ban her from the national team. In other words, she was doing it at the club professional level. And so now we're going to strike her from the US women's team, which went adults actually start thinking about that kind of a statement, you realize how ridiculous that is. And I can remember even when, so she was really on her own. She was alone. Her club coach didn't know what to do with it, club pro coach. The senior women's national team coach didn't know what to do. 
U.S. soccer wanted the coach to deal with Megan. Turned out we didn't have a policy about not taking a knee or having to stand. And so the organization had to get their act together in terms of having a policy at least. And about two years later, so they were embarrassed. They wanted to ban her. Two years later, she's thriving in the World Cup, and they are putting Megan Rapino forward. You speak on behalf of all of the players in the team now, right? Mm -hmm. So the current, the, the current had changed so much. And what happened in those two years? Again, back to some education and awareness, the, um, a consciousness awakened, if you will. We've touched on this a little bit in different answers, or you've touched on this a little bit in different answers, but the impact of social media. Um, one of the reasons there is such a backlash to some of the things that happen on the social activism front is because of social media. Um, and for any of you who've missed it, you know the thing that comes immediately to mind is what recently happened with the Houston Rockets general manager, Daryl Morey, tweeting about his support, rather, of uh, pro-democracy demonstrators in Hong Kong, and then the backlash, the multi-billion dollar backlash um, that that created and how it swept up, you know, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver and LeBron James in the process. So, Devin, you're somebody who's on social media and uses that to, um, I guess, extend your platform. How do you negotiate social media? How do you approach it so that, you know, it's a positive of a force for good and not a force for evil? <laughs> um, I think I think you have to decide how you want to use your social media. Um, you know, I think for me, I always I put social media on one end, and I put you know my friends and my group chats and my text messages on one end, and. I always think there's some things that I, I want to speak in, in my group chat and I want to talk to my friends about that I don't think, you know, is an interview. And I think of social media as always an interview. Um, anytime you go in there and speak, you're doing an interview for everyone because anyone can pick it up. Um, and I do think when you decide to speak on a topic, you should educate yourself. You shouldn't see a topic and then say, I'm just going to tweet. You know, if you don't, you know, if you don't gather enough information or know what's really going on, um, you fall into the, you know, I was hacked or I want to apologize. And I, I've always hated when guys do that. You know, if you jump out there and you decide to say something, um, let it be something you're passionate about and you believe in. So you don't have to, you know, 10 hours later say, I want to apologize for something that you meant. You know what I mean? It just, it doesn't make sense. So I always tell young guys when they first get in the NFL, um, you could get swept in the social media world and everyone's telling you it's a great marketing tool and it's great for if you want to have a cause, you need to get on it, you need to let people know your personality, blah, blah, blah. And I tell guys, first, make sure you know what you're doing. Don't ever think that you can't text your friends and have a conversation. Don't think that makes you not real because you're not voicing all your opinions. You know, we're all in here. We all have opinions on everything. We don't tell our bosses or we don't, you know, tell a coworker everything we feel. We have friends and family uh, that we do that with, too. So I think you have to, you know, first sit down and understand how you want to use your social media um, and then determine, you know, what you want to say or say and not say on it. Mm -hmm. Now, April, you mentioned Alex Morgan's, so was it 13 million followers? And you feel like that's low? I feel like that's low. Okay, I'm going to double check that. Okay. That's true. You gotta Fact. combine it all, though. It's gotta be Twitter <laughs> and Instagram. That's her total reach. Yeah. yeah, and well, you mentioned her large number of Twitter followers. I'm and just saying, there's only four million people in New Zealand. Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of followers. Yeah. It's a lot. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering. I think one of the benefits of social media, you know, in a, in a platform like Twitter, is that voices that weren't getting heard in the past get heard now. And I'm wondering if you think that. The U.S. women's national team in particular is a beneficiary of that. If they would be where they are now in terms of the equal pay fight without social media. Well, well let's be clear. First of all, um, they took the bull by the horns, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't think somebody taught them how to use Twitter or somebody said this is a strategy you need to employ as a professional athlete. These women are so clear on their vision, their mission. They said, we're going to take charge and we're going to be avid tweeters and we're going to be avid social media icons, literally. And here's how we're going to do it. And there was a strategy involved in all of it. So um, I, I think they are also 
benefactors of this new modern way of communicating um, and this new way of getting support for your message. And, you know, when you start having 12, 10, I don't know what the number is, but when you, whatever the number is for a sponsorship, right? When you can go to a sponsor and say, I have uh, 12 million followers, pretty soon you're gonna get a shampoo commercial, <laughs> right? Or a Volkswagen commercial, right? And so they're pretty clever in how they're using it. And it's a sophisticated new generation of female athletes. So uh, social media and athletes are crucial for, for the hospital. Uh, Boston Children's is the number one pediatric hospital in the country. We see kids from every state in the, the US, 150 nations worldwide. And the potential to get our brand out there through the voice of an athlete to, uh, for parents to find out that Children's really is the only place in the world that can cure their child of what specifically is wrong with them. And then also from a fundraising perspective, you know, you, you take an athlete, you add a cute baby, you put it on social media, and we can raise a lot of money. <laughs> you know, I look at um, Rob Gronkowski before the Super Bowl last year. Um, he did a raffle for the hospital in one week on social media. He did five or six different posts, raised half a million dollars for Children's Hospital. And the power that these athletes have, the platform to raise money and raise awareness is, is crucial for many hospitals and, and also Boston Children's. I was going to say, it's also Boston. And I think that plays a big role in what happens here. I mean, what'd you say, half a million he raised? Was it half a million dollars? Half a million. I mean, I don't know if that happens in another city um, without, you know, a fan base as rabid as Boston and teams as successful as Boston. So I want to I want to turn to that question: the uniqueness of Boston, how um, that influences what you do, how it impacts it. I mean, I think one thing, you know, uh, Skip in his introduction, uh, Rebecca mention Take the Lead, and that's a program that combines all the professional teams um, in the Boston area, men's and women's. Um, that's a pretty powerful group, and that's a pretty big platform. Is that kind of collaboration something you think we're going to see in the future? I mean, particularly in a city like Boston. I mean, I hope so. It's um, And for those that don't know, Take the Lead started two years ago. Yes. I'm, I'm stammering because it was before my time at the Boston Red Sox, and it was born out of an incident that happened at Fenway Park um, where an... Um, uh, an opposing two team, incidents, two incidents yeah. that happened on consecutive days. Mm -hmm. But the first was uh, with Aaron Jones, I believe. Adam Jones. Adam yeah. Jones. See, it was before my turn. Um, and he was in a, on a different team, was in our outfield, and one of our fans used a racial slur at him um, during the game. And so he made the complaint, and that fan was banned for life. And then, coincidentally, on the exact next day, um, another incident happened. And so clearly there is an issue that we're all idiots if we think that was the first time. We're all idiots if we think that was the last time. Um, but at least something happened um, intentionally afterwards, which was this um, coming together of the five professional sports teams, five being the Bruins, the Celtics, the Red Sox, and the Patriots, and the Revolution, um, came together and basically said, we're going to make a promise, we're going to make a pledge to make our venues, make our front offices, um, places that encourage diversity, that encourage inclusivity. Um, and so kind of take the lead happened. And so I started in January of 2018, shortly after it had started, and um, quickly was confused as to what the hell it was. Like I still, to this day, am feeling like it could and should be so much more. Um, I think one of the inherent challenges to this, and this is this, I'm not sharing anything confidential with you. I've, I've shared these same concerns internally at the Red Sox is that it's owned by five different organizations. If you've ever managed anything, having five directors mm -hmm. leads to impossible success. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is get one executive director or one leader of Take the Lead that can be full time on this because for no, to no one's fault, it's no one's priority right now, unfortunately, because we all have daytime jobs and every team is like always in season when you look at the calendar. And so it, there's just not enough happening. But what has happened in the last two years is we've come together and held several um, job fairs where we've been intentional about recruiting and inviting young people of color um, to come and hear about from executives um, about jobs and departments and roles that exist within the front office of a professional sports teams. Because the reality is most people aren't going to be a professional player on the field. There are more positions in the front office of those teams. And so there are multiple multiple departments, multiple multiple levels within those departments. 
And so it was just a great way to expose um, how we work as a front office from the five professional sports teams to individuals that might not get an open door invitation to understand and get um, an understanding of what jobs exist at the five professional sports teams. So we've done career fairs, we've done events at our facilities, at the bus, at the Fenway Park, at Red Auerbach Center. And so we've just tried to think about ways to really open ourselves to be more inclusive and be more diverse. But like I said, I think there is so much more that needs to be done. Um, we've done some, we, we are good, but we need to be great. Um, and it needs to be consistently great. So um, hopefully that answered your question. I'm gonna ask a couple more questions about the uniqueness of Boston, but then um, we're gonna turn it over to the audience. So be thinking um, of what you wanna ask the panel. And there is obviously, as you can see, a microphone in the center there. Um, I'll turn to Michael and then to Devin. Michael, you know, uh, you, you there's the Champions for Children's and Devin was honored at that event in 2015. Um, since 1997, that's raised 60 million? 60 plus. 60 plus. Um, I'm not sure you do that. Um, if you're not in Boston. Yeah, no, and I should also ca um, call out Carrie Campiola, who is the uh, brains Woo -woo. behind the event right there. So, Carrie, <laughs> hi. Um, November 20th, honoring Red Sox first baseman Mitch Moreland and his wife, Susanna. Um, look, it, the, the, the success of Boston sports has helped immensely. Uh, you know, This year, uh, we've been promised that the four Red Sox trophies will be there. So every year for the past, I don't know how many years, we parade in a championship trophy. It's been a Stanley Cup. It's been a Super Bowl trophy. It's been a World Series trophy. So that certainly helps us raise more money. You know, Boston... You know, it's viewed as, you know, a hub for medical creation. It's a hub for sports. It's a hub for academic um, learning. And children's is part of all of that. And that absolutely helps us um, raise more money and raise more awareness. You know, we're re recently um, rolling out a new marketing campaign where the world comes for answers is what Boston Children's Hospital is really known for. And, and we truly believe that. And, and Boston has a lot to do with that. And Devin, I don't think your platform is as big if you're not part of the Super Bowl winning, multi-Super Bowl winning New England Patriots. Oh, it's definitely not. I play defense. I, I don't uh, <laughs> I have, you know, the most stats every year. So, you know, playing here is, you know, definitely giving me an advantage. And uh, being from the New York, New Jersey area where, you know, you know, no matter how good their sports teams do, there's just so much that happens there that people, you know, don't necessarily care about sports. And uh, when I got here, I said, dang, you know, everyone cares about sports here. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think it's it's given us all the ability. Like, my teammates have events throughout the year, whether it's for diabetes or uh, pediatric cancer. You know, guys continuously have events. And each time you go to their events, they're raising a lot of times north of $100,000 at an event. And it's, you know, strictly because they're going to bring in a Tom Brady signed jersey or a Bill Belichick hoodie or, you know, a ball signed by the Super Bowl champs from last year or two years ago. And I think having that ability and having people that truly care about that, um, I think, goes a long way. And, you know, having the support of the community, you know, here in Boston and how much they love winning, you know, you understand, for one, you have to win. Um, <laughs> And then once you win, you got to take advantage and, and do some positive things because I think as much as they love sports, I think we have a community that loves hard work and wants to help each other out. So uh, when guys can use their platform to, to give people a reason to go out and celebrate others, they want to do those things. So I think it's, it's been a good job by the athletes of going out and doing those things. So I'll turn it over to the audience. Please uh, step up to the microphone and ask your Avoid question. asking me questions so we can prove, <laughs> we can prove Rebecca wrong. So going back to the political, uh, last June, uh, a delegation from the New England Patriots, uh, past and present, uh, led by uh, team owner Robert Kraft, uh, went on a promotional tour to Jerusalem. And uh, that's not the first time, of course, uh, Kraft has used the Patriots to promote Israel. Now you can compare and contrast that. Uh, a year earlier, in June of 18, the Argentine uh, National Football or Soccer, as we call it here, team uh, canceled a uh, friendly match prior to the World Cup in Jerusalem in solidarity with the boycott and uh, uh, divestment movement against Israel's occupation. Now, I mean, who is championing the right cause here? Uh, Kraft and his patriots who are supporting Israel and its occupation or Argentina uh, and uh, their uh, national team who are in solidarity uh, with freedom and self-determination for Palestinians and against the occupation? 
I'm, I'm say, wondering, you, you can't take back knowledge. These Patriots players must know about the occupation. Nobody cannot know about that now. I, I think, first of all, I just I think, you know, I think I want to just say something. One of the very important things about all of this when we have conversations about this is the piece that we talked about earlier, which is being educated and getting educated about things. So I want to say that, first of all, if, there, if you feel that you, you know, you, you're, please comment, but, you know, realize that this may not be the area of expertise here. Right, but I wanted to bring it up because there's two contrasting views here. They're both prominent uh, sports uh, entities, and uh, they're taking opposing views, and uh, there's a very yeah. serious issue involved. Yeah, and I think that you also have to realize that's not, you know, the players can't make that decision. You know, um, that is presented to us as players as a trip to Israel, you know, and I think for a lot of us, we have guys who, you know, follow the Bible and they read and they, they understand, you know, what Jerusalem means and they want to see some things. Um, so I know the group of guys that went down there this past year, they got to do some things that they read about and they want to experience. It wasn't for any political reasons or anything. And I think the hard thing as athletes is when you do decide to go somewhere, like everything you just spoke about, if you're not aware of those things or don't see it that way, then you get thrown into it. And, you know, whether an athlete vacations in Israel, does that mean he is pro or, you know, against something? I don't necessarily think that. Um, but as far as, like, Mr. Kraft and what he decides to do with the team compared to Argentina, like, I can't answer that. I, like, that's his decision. I think that's what comes with when you decide to own a team. You make those decisions. I think it's easy for myself or anyone else that sits and watches to – criticize that, but I think he always will have that right to decide of what he wants to do, taking a team there or not taking a team. But I know for the guys that I know who went, um, I know you said there's no way they, they couldn't have known that. Those guys didn't go down there with that pretense of being on one side or the other side. They went down there to experience um, Jerusalem and Israel uh, for their time, for most of them for the first time. My fandom should be completely obvious. <laughs> um, First of all, um, Devin, personally, from me and from all the fans everywhere, I want to personally thank you for everything that you and the guys have done. You owe me absolutely nothing. You paid in spades. Um, but I'd like to know, you're only human. We all are. And we get up, we get down. You handle yourself brilliantly in the press conferences, I must say like dignity, I don't know how you do it, but we're gonna find out. Um, what do you do to decompress? What are your hobbies? Thank um, you. Uh, and what my, are the interesting hobbies that the other guys might have? Because it, again, they have to get away from it every once in a while. Yeah, and I think, you know, you asked the other guys, the unique thing about a locker room is it ranges from everywhere. We got guys that if it was up to them on their free time, they would go, you know, out to the fort, like in the forest and go and shoot guns all day. Like that excites guys. We got guys that just want to bowl. We got guys like Ted Karras that just wants to read every book. Like he read a book on all the things that salt is used for past, <laughs> in the past and the present. And I've sat down to have a conversation with him. So um, I think one of the major ways we decompress, though, is spending time with each other, not talking about football. Um, you know, the night before this game, there were about six or seven of us that sat in the meal room till like 9.30 at night just talking, just talking about whatever it is, you know, whatever was on the, I don't even remember what was on TV, um, but just continuing to talk. And I think through that, we learn about each other's kids, our wives, our personal stories. Um, and I think when you have that, you can decompress by sometimes just calling one of your buddies up or we come in a locker room and you're just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, but a lot of my decompression falls on my wife. She has to hear a lot of my <laughs> complaining and all of that. So uh, she's probably the real one that you want to really thank. Bless you and the guys, Devin. And, and thank if you. you're wondering, I like to cook. And I <laughs> <laughs> no, he, does, he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He's done. Good evening, everybody. I'm Alton, junior at Weston High. I had a question for everybody on the panel, athletes past and present, male or female, doesn't matter, anybody who I wants love to you pick already. it up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so you all touched a lot tonight about your impact on a large scale. 
Could you just talk about how do you bring awareness on a small level and whether that's in the locker room, that's in the front office, and away from the athlete perspective. And we know how much a baby and an athlete can raise millions of dollars on an Instagram feed, but what are you doing on the person-to-person, on the face-to-face value? I can Great answer question. that. Um, just being a mom for me is like my biggest, I have three kids, six, four, and two. And so for me, that is my biggest challenge every day to raise good people. And so that's where I feel like I have the most focus in life is to make sure I'm investing the most of myself in what I want them to be. Um, I'm doing that every single day, all day. Um, and so I'm really on a small scale, I feel like I'm that's the hardest job yeah. is to raise humans that become good contributors to our society and kind people. And so I feel like that's, that's what I'm contributing on a small level. Other? Yeah. Um, what comes to mind is <clears throat> I wasn't, I don't think of myself originally as a role model and I don't walk around the streets or on the airplane here today or anywhere as a role model. And then I bump into somebody in soccer who maybe knows me or sees my name tag on my backpack or my computer bag, and they say something. And so it's my responsibility to then give back to them because they love it. It's like this gentleman here who, you know, uninhibitedly just walked up and was loving Devin up. And, you know, that's the gift that keeps on giving to us. Uh, when we are role models. So for me, it's always been on a daily basis, just try to conduct my life in a way in which I am proud of, I can sleep well, and to give back when people do recognize or ask questions or want some dose of inspiration or need a dose of inspiration. Um, I work at Boston Children's Hospital for a lot of reasons. Um, And one of those reasons is truly the mission. You know, I have three little kids and you know, the, the health of children is important to me. So, um, and I don't get to do this enough, but just going to the hospital on a regular basis and seeing those families and talking to those families and doing crafts with kids and, and just being there, support, supporting them because they're in a difficult place under a very stressful time. And um, you're able to do that, you know, far too often because of there's just so many patient families. But you know, that, that's really the, the, the mission part of the job. I mean, I'll be short. It's really what all three of them said, you know, um, first and foremost, I have a two-year-old and a one-year-old. So um, trying to, to be there for them as much as I'm there for other people. Um, I always remember Matt Slater said that to me. Um, the most important thing we can do as a man, you know, is be in our household for our wife and for our children. You know, more important than being out there and championing causes and doing all of that. If you can't make sure what's right at home, then it doesn't really matter. Um, and then I think of, of just being in the community. You know, a lot of people approach me a lot of times, and I think just being myself, you know, taking time to talk to someone, to, to listen to them, to be able to give, you know, my opinion on something, and just to be real, um, I think is, is overall how I try to do it in a small impact in a small group. The first one I wanted to ask about is that over, I believe, the summer and, like, earlier this fall, um, the... Uh, people who play women's professional hockey have formed the Professional Women's Hockey Player Association and have refused to work in any other uh, major, you know, major league, professional league uh, teams. So I was just wondering uh, for everyone, what's your opinion on that? Mm. Yeah. 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 Well, I know Julie Foudy connected with the ice hockey team many, many years ago and have helped them. They don't have the same number. We have about 2 million female soccer players. They have about 40,000 ice hockey players in the US. So it's a different number. Um, But I'm actually not very familiar with that, to be honest. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned that uh, working at the Celtics, you felt like more players had a willingness to speak up and, uh, you know, talk about serious issues and that at the Red Sox you find less of that and I was wondering if you think that that could possibly be tied to the players race because I feel like especially like white men have a privilege that not everyone has and so they don't understand the struggles of people of color so I was just wondering if you think that that's any part of it what's your opinion on that? Yes I think you're very insightful 
And I think you are right. I think that absolutely plays into it. I also think our fan base plays into it. So if you look at Fenway Park, it is not very diverse. It's mostly white men. I think the demographic is like white men ages 30 to 55 is like our target demographic. And that's most of the faces in Fenway Park. If you look at a TD in the TD Garden during a Celtics game, it doesn't really look like that. And so I think um, our players know that. And I think in ML, in the MLB, um, in, yeah, Major League Baseball, um, and at Fenway Park for the Boston Red Sox, we know who our fan base is and we know what issues they predominantly stand for. And I think at the Celtics, there was no coincidence that they were more willing to be more forward with their thinking and progressive given our fan base. Um, and so I think all of that plays into it. Um, unfortunately, um, but it's a reality and it's one that I'm hoping to smash. Um, I'm going to be Khaleesi and break the wheel. Um, that was a Game of Thrones reference. Hello. <laughs> Is this thing on? <laughs> um, so, so I don't know. I just, I, I, again, going back to your original question, but I, I just, I feel very excited about my role here and having the wisdom and the vision and the awareness and the perspective of, of these voices that have not been recognized or heard or represented or stood up for in so long and really trying to fight the fight that hasn't been fought um, in Major League Baseball for a while. So, And just to add, and I think that is very important because I look at guys like I got an opportunity to play with Chris Long, who... Um, He'll tell you right away, you know, his dad's Howie Long, Hall of Fame football player, and he grew up with privilege. And he used to say, shame on him if he sat in a locker room surrounded with all these men that he called friends and, and heard the stories they got that they had to go through, and he didn't do something. He didn't show compassion for him. So um, I do think, like you said, it is a difference. I think even within teams, like you look at different teams, you know, even in the NFL where you have guys who speak out and guys who don't or, you know, the backlash from the fans and the home base, it is. You know, like here, when we took a knee, it was a lot worse than, you know, in Miami or different cities uh, where it's just different demographically. So, um, but I do think it within this charge and, you know, trying to get social justice and, and bring equality, I think it is very important to get some of those men who are white men who grew up with privilege. You know, Kyle Corver wrote a great piece uh, Players Tribune, um, you know, hearing these these different guys step out um, and step out on a limb and support other guys, I think has been awesome. And that's why the Megan Rapinos of the world are so important, exactly. you know, for it can't just be the people that are fighting the fight, fighting the fight. We need to have allies and we need to have accomplices and we need to have people that are willing to stand alongside us, even if it's not your fight or your cause. Um, and that's why it was so exciting to see her take the plat take the knee and use her platform to extend CAP's platform um, in that way. And I feel like we, ju we, ju we need more. We can't do it alone. Good evening. Uh, a question, I think, for the three ladies, but I'd, I'd be curious also on the gentlemen. It's an equal pay question applicable to soccer with the litigation going on in the federal courts. Um, Major League Soccer is gonna have a new collective bargaining agreement starting next year, so they're almost there. And the US men's national team is right in the middle of this. I'm curious from a woman's point of view on the equal pay issue, is there an expectation that this is the time for men to step forward if we're really talking about equality? And if there is, what have you seen? Are the men stepping forward? Some would suggest all you need is the men's national team in Major League Soccer to shut themselves down and insist on equal pay. Like your feedback on that. Well, I'll start real quick. I remember, uh, you know, Billie Jean King saying in the 70s, right, in the 70s that uh, for women's equal rights and opportunities, we need to get all the men on board. Because once the men who have daughters, who have daughters, who want to play sports, and they go to a high school, and there's a baseball field, but there's not a softball field. Or there's a soccer field for boys, but there's not a soccer team for girls. As soon as the men got on board with the equal rights opportunity for girls, then there was real change. So I think that's coming. Another story, very quickly, that's probably not known in this country, but... Um, one of the best players in the world in women's soccer opted out of the World Cup this summer because she was very upset with her federation, Norway, and she has had some challenges with them. And she basically walked away from the Norwegian team under principle. 
and said, I'm not going to play for you anymore. And meanwhile, the men's national team in Norway said, we're not going to play unless you pay us equally. And now that federation in Norway pays the men and the women equally. So I do think when the men start to step up and fight for their women, their daughters, their children, um, we will see enormous change. Because otherwise, it's just women advocating for women. And I remember years ago wondering, do men have to have breast cancer before they'll get on board with breast cancer? <laughs> Because you know, they'll tell you that 1% of men do get breast cancer. And I'm like, I know that. It's 1%. <laughs> and so, but seriously, do, do our men have to have a daughter or a mother or a, a grandmother or, you know, a sister that have breast cancer before they get on board with it? Um, I think there's a lot of causes out there in the world and we can't subscribe to all or donate to all or participate or spend our time in all. But we can get all of the Red Sox to have a passion right. and give back. Right. We can get all those guys in that, you know, and I'm not targeting the Red Sox. Um, Nats, Nats are playing in, in about right. 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. my point being is we don't have to get, you know, just we have to get the men to start thinking about giving back because it, it's been pretty easy to be uh, them for many years. All You're right. good. Go You're good. Ahead. Well, first of all, Rebecca, I'd like to say that I appreciated your Game of Thrones reference. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm glad someone appreciated it. I, for it. one, I appreciated it. <laughs> okay, good. Um, Did you like season eight? <laughs> now we're going deep. Season eight was it. appalling. <laughs> um, so second of all, just like to thank all of you for everything you've done in the community. And I guess my question is, you guys, I didn't know if I was too close. You guys uh, recently touched upon the topic of the, um, the Hong Kong tweet by the Rockets GM. And um, I guess I was wondering, it's a question for all of you really, but um, specifically the athletes, not to <laughs> take a shot at you or anything. Um, but just, I, I know you guys all have such busy schedules and like, like you guys previously mentioned, your parents and you're trying to raise families and be there for them and be prevalent in your children's lives. And so what I was wondering, I guess, is as a professional athlete and being so busy with everything that you do, how do you, how do you find the time, I guess, to stay in touch with all, everything that's going on in the world? I mean, I, for one, can't speak for everybody else here, but um, I know that I'm not as busy as you guys and I can't find the time to keep up on everything. So um, I guess I was just wondering how you guys go about handling that, especially when you ask questions from the media regarding issues such as Israel or Hong Kong? I, I don't answer if I don't know it. And um, if I do answer it, I can only answer the part that I do know. And I think um, for me is the free time I do have, I read on the stuff that I want to know about. And um, I think as athletes, you know, we're always known as the jocks or we're not smart. And I think guys sometimes find themselves trying to educate themselves in everything. So, you, you know, you become a jack of all trades, but a master of none. You don't really know anything. You know the headlines to a bunch of different topics um, because you're, you're scared to say, like, I don't, I, don't, I don't know enough information about that. I'm not going to speak on it. Um, but then the things you do know, you speak on. Like, I'm, I'm big on education. So I've researched education in Massachusetts. And uh, luckily for me, there's a lot of people who already have done this work. And I'm able to talk to them or they're able to send me articles to read. And I do that. But then, like, you actually the Hong Kong situation. I've seen a headline. I've seen an article or two. But to say I'm in depth and I know about it, I don't. So if I get asked about it in the media, I just, I would politely say I don't have enough information. Sorry, I can't give you much on that. And I think that's how I, that's how I think about it and how I go about it. Gotcha. Yeah, same thing. Like I have, I feel like 37 minutes at night to actually do the stuff that I want to do for me because I'm either wearing my boss hat at work or my mom hat at home. And um, that's watching Game of Thrones. It's not reading about politics. So. <laughs> I know. Literally, and so 36 of those minutes goes to re-watching re Game of Thrones episodes. Um, no, it's, it's really, really hard. And I feel like when I do actually have the chance to get on my phone and read the news, I need to prioritize what I'm reading about because I can't know everything. There's a lot I don't know. Um, and I need to be knowledgeable about what what I'm responsible for and what I'm accountable for in my job. And then it is beneficial for me to know about what's happening in the league and my team. Just so when I'm at work and people are like, oh my God, you hear about that trade? And I'm like, do we play for a baseball team? I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, I know what's happening. And so 
there's just, to your point, like I could not, I'm not going to debate with you about the, the tweet about Hong Kong. I know a headline and I know maybe an article, but I, there's a lot I don't know. And there's like 14% of my brain that's left for like new information, I feel like. And it needs to go to like forward motion, motion in my career. Um, and so it's just prioritizing, I think, the uptake of information or download, whatever your preference. Um, and it's, it, it, it's very infrequent and it happens at night, the 37 minutes. Gotcha. It's very difficult for, you know, 19, 20, 20, 21-year-old athletes to be faced with um, the celebrity and everything that comes along with, uh, with bec becoming a professional athlete. So my question is, and I, this is across all the boards from, you know, baseball to soccer to football, what type of resources are available to the athletes and how have those changed over the course of the past you know, decade, from a decade to everything that's happened recently with Kaepernick. Uh, it, it seems like the Patriots have a extremely polished uh, presentation when it comes to their athletes, where other organizations don't. And I think it's incredibly important if we're going to be telling, you know, we have this shut up and dribble mentality that, that we're talking about today. I think it's important for this education to be out there. Is that something that's available to the athletes? And, and, and if so, um, has it developed and how has it developed? Good question. I mean, I can speak to the front office at the Red Sox. So when I was at the Celtics, I had the benefit of running both the foundation and the community relations department, which meant I oversaw what we did as a foundation, but I also got to work with the guys. And so I had a really tight thread between the foundation work and them, so I could link them very easily. I'm now at the Red Sox, where we're much bigger than the Celtics, and so I don't, I don't run CR. I just run the foundation. It's run by someone else. And so all the information that's fed to the players is done through someone other than myself. And so there is um, an unfortunate, I feel like, kind of disconnect between what we're doing and them. Um, that said, I also feel like these things don't help too with their up, up, downloading of information because it's just coming in down sideways into them. Um, and I feel like we have got to do a better job internally of streamlining that communication and making more, to your point, resources available to them, um, whether that be more staff because right now we just have literally one person that's assigned to all the guys and everything they do in the community. And in my opinion, that's not enough. Um, and I think, no offense to that person, but I think we need to have more formally trained people in certain um, situations, educations, um, backgrounds to be able to equip them with the solutions and language that they might need to get themselves through and an out of a conversation or situation. So that was a long-winded way of saying I think we have more work to do in that area. I'll just chime in very quickly. We have a village that's raising our women, if you will. And the village is, of course, the team, the coaching staff, the support personnel around our players. But it may surprise you, or many of you, that we started about 15, 16 years of age where our youth national team, our first World Cup age group is the U17 age group. And so we'll start selecting those players at about 15. They'll have their first media training at 15, 16 years of age. And it pays dividends. And they start realizing very quickly that they say like, 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 <laughs> like all the time. They learn from our women because there's a lot of, even though women's sports not on television in the same volume it is men's sports, um, there's a lot of video presence, both through the social media, but also on our website. There's a lot of um, stories of all of our women. Like, it's a little bit like watching American Idol. Has every candidate at American Idol had some sorry story that's so sad that makes you tear up right when they get to the quarterfinals, right? <laughs> Same with our women. They all have a story. So we say, you know, it's upon you as an athlete at 15, 16 years of age to start following our women and know their story, know their role models. So the, it's a village. It, it, it's one press officer who's been there for 25 years who goes to all the Youth World Cups and eventually starts training all of our players at a young age. And you know Aaron Heifetz, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even, you know, Becca, who um, he didn't work in Boston. He didn't work in the pro ranks, but uh, she knows him. So he's teaching them, but, you know, formally, but more importantly, it's the village that's teaching our women how to act, conduct, speak, articulate their perspective. And women soccer players love a little debate at the breakfast table because professional athletes have a lot of time to sit around and have a 40-minute breakfast. 
And so there'll be a lot of debate going on, and it helps shape their thinking, I think. I just will chime in quickly. We have, the Red Sox obviously have the media and the PR, and the, all that training is there. I was speaking more to the kind of current causes or the current political state. That, those types of issues and stuff is where I think we just need to be more responsive um, with our players. That, that's exactly where I was going to jump in. If you, I think you got to understand professional sports is a business. So you talk about resources to be successful on the field and to stay out of trouble to be successful on the field. We got everything. We have a player development guy. We got a ton of coaches. We got different people you can go to that can help you be a successful football player. Um, but, you know, obviously I'm, I've only played for the Patriots, but having friends and teammates that have played other places, I would say close to every 32 teams are all alike. They care about you as a player. They don't, and it's not, you know, I don't want to say like it's a terrible thing because I think all you guys that have jobs overall, your job cares about the group effort your your company's supposed to do more than you as an individual. Um, but I would agree with Rebecca, when you talk about how to help manage and, and do different things in the community, now you're starting to see teams are starting to put together player engagement uh, little departments that now, you know, they're not only doing, you know, build a playground and do different things in the community that are great, but now they're also stepping out to, you know, set up, visits to juvenile uh, detention centers or do some of the things that players are passionate about because, you know, from what we saw from Kaepernick, a, a lot of teams weren't able to handle what we're going, what was going on. Their answer was to, uh, like you said, the, the um, women's national team was to let's put a policy in a place to say if a guy doesn't stand, he has, and as soon as they tried to put the policy in, you saw every player spoke out against it. And every owner had side conversations with players and every player told their owner, if you guys do this, every player will do something to respond to that. So then what happened a month later? Oh, we decided to call. So I think now you're starting to see um, a lot of maneuvering on how to make this uh, a better thing. And like you said earlier, with education, you know, fortunate for us, I've had Mr. Kraft, you know, Jonathan and Robert Kraft willing to sit in on panel discussions, to go to meetings, to educate themselves. They wrote an op-ed with me on, uh, on Raging the Age. So they've been very willing to learn and to educate themselves. So I think you've seen us try to move in a direction where all the players can be more involved and feel free to go out there and do different things. You know, Dietrich Wise just had a block party in Mattapan just to help the community out to do something. So I think because of that, you're starting to see some of the NFL teams do it. But, you know, we have owners that are, you know, mid to upper 70s that have owned teams and they've seen a whole different life than what we think. So um, it'll be interesting to see some of the younger generation that will take over some of these teams to see how it affects uh, teams moving forward. That's great to hear. Thank you again very much. In the last question, most of the question, most of it was unsaid. Um, advocacy, advocacy is a very powerful thing, but it can also be a destructive thing. I was so mad in the World Cup. I was enjoying it until Rapino went 100 on this thing. She divided, I'm a social media freak, and I, I'll tell you, there's a lot of people who just, it went so sour. I just lost interest in the whole thing. I still followed the, the game because I have a lot of players I care for. I see the future, the young generation coming up. But I was like, why? Why is it a veteran player who is about to retire doing this? And did she really get down to strategically present this issue? The issue is valid, but is someone educating these athletes to present issues so that they do not harm the progress, especially of certain sports? The Patriots, the NFL can do it. NHL can do it. Yeah. And WNBA cannot go that way. There's a lot. Uh, there's a lot to sports to the sports business side of things that affects the sport in general. Move it up. The uh, NWSL cannot go that route. It's going to have, it's going to slow down the women's soccer growth in the country. So for me, from my perspective, it's okay for people to do this. But are they doing it in such a way that it's going to create a backward movement as opposed so to? I, the I think we've got movement. it. And in April, it looks like you were poised to. To, to uh, make a well, comment. I was just questioning what it was. What, what, did, yeah. what did Megan do that was 
she went all political, right? She was representing the United States. When you wear that uniform, yeah. when you get out of this country, you're carrying a U.S. passport. It was okay for her to wait until she was done to do that. I didn't like that. She pulled her political partiality yeah. into that moment where everyone was behind the team because it was the United States yeah, of yeah, America. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, my first thought is, oh, no, she didn't. She did not just say that. Um, but then you can't censor Megan Rapino. You cannot. You can't muzzle her. You can't give her a rule. You can't. It is oppressive for her. She is um, such an expressive full person. Did I just make a word up? Expressive. <laughs> She's so expressive. You can't strap her down. You can't tire. You can't silence her. You can't muzzle her. I mean, think of the stress that she's been under during the World Cup, and she's performing at the highest level in the world. So it's really, for me, it's, a, it's like our kids. Our kids do things that we are not a proud of, right? I don't, and then you still love them up. And I think she actually regretted saying a few things during the World Cup, uh, but she makes no apologies for it because it's actually what she thinks. And so, um, yeah, for me, being at my age and, you know, I've known her since she was about 14, you can't suppress that personality. It is bubbling over. The pink hair is her. That is her personality, not just during the World Cup to get attention. That is her all the time. So um, I love her up. I Criticize her when she uses the F-bomb or brings politics into things when it's probably easier not to. But how do you, you, you can't have, you can't pull on in, both ends of the rope. And I, I also think you were saying that it was, you were worried that it was going to step back the sport. I, I would push back and say I think it's elevated the sport from everything that I've seen and everything that I've heard. I know the numbers, they're leading the, they're leading in Nike sales for jerseys oh right now. Oh my God, don't even go there. <laughs> Why? Yeah. When you're on the, on the other side of things, you can tell there is a lot of friction. I don't mind that they do the advocacy. I believe that everybody should have an opinion and take a stand on issues. I think that's the beauty, of, especially in the United States. But knowing when and where and who else is going to be affected. I would like to see the numbers for the NWSL. I think they're up. I think numbers, uh, viewership is up. Yeah, I think is. viewership for the U.S. women's national team and the NWSL is all up. It's a World and Cup. And sales are up. So bottom line, I think, is improved. Is it since. because it's a World Cup year? I think everything that happened. I mean, I think both from the players and their performance and winning. And then I think the professional players going back to their pro teams, yeah. the, the whole league has been completely elevated. It's everywhere I look and everything that I hear. So I'm surprised to hear you say that you think it's done there, yeah. a detriment I mean, to the league. Because everything I've seen has been up. I would say from a male athlete's perspective, I loved it. Because um, I know like when we took a knee, people were, I think it's the same thing you're saying. Like people told me I turned on when I sit down on my couch at 1 p.m., I want to watch football. Mm -hmm. They said, I don't want to see you take a knee and tell me about a political view. So my response was that, well, when do you want to see me do that? Because how you play, you can take a stand. But my problem season. is, when the game goes off, mm -hmm. who watches? You have social media. I know. Afterwards. But my, So Megan Rapino, Alex Morgan, 13 mm -hmm. million. Me, Twitter, 150,000. Mm -hmm. So how do I get people to see it? How does... How does Dietrich Wise, mm -hmm. a lot of people here don't even know who that is. So you're on a payroll paid into by people with different political affiliations. So I think you wouldn't do that on a typical job. Why would you do it in an NFL league? But I think that's what the NFL grants us, though, because in a typical job, you wouldn't bash your head against the wall, <laughs> right? Yeah, so and, I, I think we have to be careful when we compare typical jobs because we do something that's a little different and that gives us a platform like Muhammad Ali. When Muhammad Ali was speaking out and not wanting to fight, a lot of people said, why is he doing this? We want to see him box. You know, and I think by him doing that, though, some people didn't like it, but it gave some people who were scared to speak up and have that voice. So I think as an athlete, you have to decide, do I care more about making some people angry 
or do I care more about maybe inspiring some other people? But I think no matter what, like you have your opinion. I think as an athlete, you have to realize there's going to be people that think what you're doing is not what they want to see. And, and I think we're going to have to, we're going to have to end it there. So I want to, um, <laughs> th thank you everybody. I, I want to um, thank the panelists. Sorry. Kira, Devin, Michael, April, and Becca, thank you so very, very much for your generosity, for Thanks, uh, sharing your busy lives with us this evening. Uh, thank you for everything that you do day in and day out to change lives. Um, April, I want to just lift you up um, and let, let folks know, April uh, came very early this afternoon and met for about 40 minutes with the uh, Suffolk women's soccer team. Um, they were... <laughs> They were uh, so thrilled and so uh, taken, um, so excited to meet you. They had done research. I mean, they really, really uh, wanted to present themselves well. A number of them had uh, classes this evening who couldn't be here. I think some may still be here, and they have a big game tomorrow. So go Suffolk women's soccer team up in New Hampshire tomorrow. And, uh, and most importantly, thank you all for being a part of tonight's conversation. Thank you for your wonderful, insightful questions. And I hope to see you at future Fort Hall forums. Thank you so very much.